Hello, and welcome to another episode of our 20-Minute Playbook series, where each week we sit down with an elite performer, from iconic founders to world-renowned investors and best-selling authors, to dive into the ideas, frameworks, and strategies that got them to the top of their field, all in less than 20 minutes. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on the show today, I'm joined by Howie Schwab, who manages more than $5 billion in emerging market growth for Driehaus, which is a firm that's based in Chicago and where Howie has worked for the last 20 years. At Driehaus, Howie is the lead portfolio manager for the Emerging Markets Growth Strategy. In this episode, Howie shares why he thinks we're in the middle of a massive pendulum shift in demographics and capitalism that's been shaped by the last 40 years, and what that means for the years ahead. He shares the mentors he's most grateful for and what he learned from each. The advice he'd give himself if he could go back to the beginning of his career, and the most important lesson he's learned so far. You can find the notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 107. That's 107. For more, you can find Howie Schwab on Twitter at HS underscore barn. That's HS underscore B-A-R-N. And you can learn more about Driehaus online at driehaus.com, which is spelled D-R-I-E-H-A-U-S. With that, let's dive into Howie Schwab's playbook. Howie, thank you so much for joining me again on 20 Minute Playbook. This episode is going to be a lot of fun, I think. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive right in. I want to start first by asking about a recent fascination. And so I'm looking for something that's been intriguing you, something that's been standing out in your mind or that you've been noticing in the world, something that you can't stop thinking about. Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think this is the crux of what you and I have spent so many hours talking about, but it is this sort of regime shift. Um, and I get the opportunity to uh, introduce the metric that I, I forgot before. But, you know, even in, during the COVID you know, period, we've, just this year, you know, we've seen 75, as I was mentioning to you, globally, we've seen 75 interest rate hikes. Which in, is 2022. Largest, in, sorry, in 2022. Sorry, in 2022. Yeah, yeah which, is, which is the largest percentage of net central bank tightening that we've seen in about 15 years, kind of right prior to the GFC. And while 75 hikes seems like a large number, when you contrast that with over 1,000 net cuts since the GFC, and on top of that $23 trillion of QE, I think it's clear that we've, we've sort of reached the end of you know, 40 years of sort of policy omnipotence and kind of the golden era of the, of the central banker. And associated with that lower inflation, um, lower volatility, and you know, much as we've talked about uh, long duration assets and financial assets you know, being literally the only place to invest and the kind of the counter corollary to that being you know, either short duration or real assets. Um, so I do think that that tied in with the other things we've talked about, inequality, demographics, you know, the, the debt burden in the country certainly are, are pointing towards a regime shift. And I think really simplistically, you know, we're hearing a lot of Wall Street commentators talk about, you know, is this the end of a 40-year bond bull market? But I think that's only really one component. And I think, honestly, that's, it's almost like a corollary that goes along with the regime we've been in for 40 years. But I think the big, you know, when you ask me, like, what am I, why is it intriguing me? Like everybody, you know, cogn- cognitively, it's very, very difficult to pull yourself away from how you've invested and those underlying variables that we've invested in for the last 40 years. Um, and I think a lot of investors will struggle with that. And, and I'm not so sure that portfolios are well positioned for a shift in this regime. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And just on bonds, you know, I, I totally agree. I think that's probably the most uninteresting part of that <laughs> regime shift story. And there's a there's a, many other components of it that are Frightening, intriguing, but uh, yeah, the bond piece is relatively minor. I, I want to uh, you know talk next about when you think about investing, what do you think are your superpowers? And are those things that you know are just the way you're wired? Are those things that somebody taught you or you picked up? How do you think about you know what drives kind of outperformance or what you're uniquely just really good at when it comes to investing? I think it's, it's have, keeping an open mind and kind of retaining a certain malleability, um, which you know, not being too dogmatic in what you're trying to do. And again, having strong convictions held loosely, as we talked about previously, I think that's important. I think, you know, along those same lines, you know, being, you know, when I say competitive, I think it's um, sort of fixation or, or being more irritated by your losses, you know, net, net, than, than sort of celebrating your victories and, and having this constant yearning 
for sort of how do we get to the next level? And lastly, going along with the first question, particularly today, maybe more than ever between, you know, the variables behind this regime shift, plus, you know, what technology has, has done in terms of shaping investments, whether it's passive or, you know, potentially, you know, the crypto sort of Web3 younger generation. I just think it's really important that, that you sort of have that flexibility of mind because there's just a, and this, this industry is littered, you know, the history is littered with firms who were on top of the world and, um, you know, achieved obsolescence more or less within a decade, um, LTCM being the, the most notorious. Yep. And that seems to happen very often around regime shift times where effectively people are unable to decouple from past behavior, past ways of looking at and understanding the world. And I think move to a new model of doing that, which also just to be super fair, makes sense. It's enormously difficult to try to change your emotional wiring, your mental wiring. But I think that that's one that's a requirement if you want to be a successful investor across market cycles and regimes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, we've talked about this as well, but in terms of how we invest, I think integrating and, and overlaying macro as well as behavioral components, um, you know, not simply wedding ourselves to this bottom up, here's our specific template and it's time tested is, is really important. And macro, and macro and behavioral, as you might imagine, are a bit more abstract and a bit more um, fluid. So that requires a certain mindset. And, and some people really embrace that and, and some really struggle. Yeah. I want to ask Ness next about what mentors or figures shaped your approach to investing the most. And this can be, you know, I imagine obviously 20 plus years at Driehaus, spending a lot of time with Richard, you know, the founder of the firm. I'm sure he was a wonderful mentor. Are there, you know, whether it's him or other people, what mentors and figures have shaped your approach to investing and just have shaped you? Yeah. I mean, start off by just saying I completely agree. It's something that I wish I had more of is mentorship. And, and I've quoted Stan Drunkenmiller a few times, but I think he has a quote, something to the extent of, if you have a choice between a paycheck and a mentor, take the mentor. And I absolutely agree. I mean, it's something that we, we could never get enough of. So yeah, I think, I think Richard, just because I started at Driehaus, you know, out of school and was able to work for Richard Driehaus, you know, at the time he was six months removed from being you know, named by Barons as one of the top 20 investors of the preceding century. That was, you know, there's a lot of insights that I received from, from working with him. But I think the main takeaways really where he emphasized that investing's you know, an art as much or more than a science. And that kind of goes along with the flexibility and, and malleability. And he, you know, to his credit, didn't ding me at all for the fact that I was sort of a liberal arts graduate with, with minimal you know, financial skills. And I think that's actually been, you know, a point of success for me, but it took me a while to realize. I think also Richard, despite the fact that he, again, had accolades, had been named by barons, had plenty of money, was extraordinarily competitive, which is a trait that for better or worse, I shared with him um, and really was very much against apathy or complacency. And again, I think to be a great investor, being fluid, but also having this hunger and passion and so really a hatred for losing. I mean, I've always said it's, I think it's more important that you, you hate losing rather than love winning. I think they're, they're two distinct things. And I think he, he re- I, th- I think I already possessed that, but he reinforced the ways that he influenced me was more about, I think really he instilled a sense of a confidence in, in, in doing things differently and being different. And, and he certainly was an eccentric individual himself, but I think also seeing that you need to be, you know, sometimes a little left or right of center um, to be a great investor. And so I think those things rubbed off. I, you know, I think beyond that, um, and we talked about this earlier, maybe it's not a, a mentor in the conventional sense of like, hey, we work together, but you know, reading books and I think reading you know, a number of the narratives and, and quotes that Stan Drunkenmiller has, has come out with, you know, I, I, there's, there's just such an abundance of things to read. And, and um, particularly, I think his mindset and the way that he also kind of approaches the markets and talks about liquidity or, you know, I love his quote about uh, basically he says like great investment managers need to focus, you know, the ones that he knows have focused on their failures and, you know, requires a huge dose of humility. Um, Yeah. I think there's a lot of lessons you can learn from reading about the great investors, um, getting access to interviews or newsletters or, or, uh, you know, full books, if that's what it takes. 
Yeah. I think said another way, you know, to be a good investor, you can't spend all your time patting yourself on the back. It, it really is like looking in the mirror, warts and all, <laughs> and and assessing what's gone well, but spending as much time, if not more time, obviously, uh, on what's not going well or what you're missing or what could be improved. Because I think there's al- always as well, too, I think that's something I feel like every year I have a new awareness of that there's just more things to be good at, more things to know, more things to refine. I want to ask next if you have a favorite quote or anecdote about investing. And this can be a serious quote or anecdote. I know we talked about a couple so far. It can be a hilarious one, you know, like Warren Buffett's, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes from him, you know, you never know who's who's swimming naked until obviously the tide comes out. Um, Do you have a favorite quote or anecdote about investing? I mean, I just mentioned the you know, the drunken Miller quote about you know great investors and how they obsess over their failures. Um, so I think that's that's one, and and it really ties in. I mean, I'll use a quote from from Richard, where he always would la- he would laugh as he said it, but he he would always kind of look at you and just say, "Hey, if you don't want to win, don't worry, you won't." And I think the what he meant by that again was that hey, this in- this industry takes a lot of hard work. To your point, you have to look in the mirror. It's 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 emotionally draining at times. And you know, for those who have seen the Last Dance with Michael, you know about Michael Jordan. Yeah, I watched him obviously growing up, but some may have walked away from that series thinking, "Well, what a jerk." I mean, to me, it just gave me all the more respect for him because to be as great as he as he is and was. And you can see to this day, he's talking about games and, you know, he's regular season games that he played 30 years ago where he's clearly like foaming at the mouth and just, you can tell he wants to get out in the court. I think you need to have that instinct um, because it comes, because in you know, investing in a lot of ways, it's sort of like the gladiators. <laughs> it's you're up against people who are just as smart as you and, and oftentimes better resourced. And, you know, even when you're right, you can be wrong. And um, when you're wrong, you can be really wrong. So it's, uh, it's sobering. Yeah. Yeah. You can be right today and two times as wrong tomorrow. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Portfolio I mean, absolutely. and investments and decisions. Like the David Tice story when he was yeah, short AOL for whatever it was, one or two years and finally took it off. And then six months later, the stock imploded. So was he right or was he wrong? You know, I mean, he lost money. So I guess the presumption is wrong, but his thesis was right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a challenging, it's a challenging business to be in. If you could go back to the start of your career and whisper some advice, words of wisdom, maybe just even reminders in your ear, what would you say to your younger self? So kind of take us back 20 plus years ago when you were first joining Dree House, what would you tell yourself then? And you maybe even in college. <laughs> well, I, th- I think you leave more time for that kind of unstructured creative tinkering that we, we've talked about before especially if you're trying to to really apply yourself and work hard, it's very easy to get caught up in the day to day. And, and, but what you find is that oftentimes the best investment decisions are actually what seem to be the most logical or straightforward. And part of that is just zooming out and getting, you know, whether it's going up on a mountain for two days or just exercising an hour a day or meditation, something that allows you to kind of free your mind because and it's only been exacerbated in the past 20 years since I entered the industry, but there's just so much noise and so much data and information coming at you that, it, and I still struggle, uh, but the ability to remove yourself from that somehow is, is important. Yeah, I think loosely related to that, read, you know, cast a wide net and read a variety of opinions, topics, subjects. A big mistake I made in my first five to 10 years of investing was to become sort of enamored with these doomsday type of commentators who would just make such compelling arguments that, you know, guys like Mark Faber who wrote the gloom, boom and doom report. And I think it's fine to read, you know, those authorities, but make a conscientious effort to offset those with somebody equally positive or bullish. I mean, a lot of people belittle Tom Lee, but he's generally been right for the past several years. And so, you know, read him along with somebody more, more cautious. I think build your network is something that I, you know, I never really had an appreciation for networking and I kind of frowned upon it initially, but I think there's different, you know, networking doesn't necessarily have to uh, connotate like trying to find an angle to, to, you know, grift some money. I think it's more about 
just having a variety of people that you can bounce ideas off of and talk to and get different perspectives. And that's, that's truly like invaluable. So I think those are the, you know, I, I'd go back to myself to, to really value all of, all of those things. And I, and I think lastly, um, it's really difficult, especially when you're young. I mean, not for everybody, but um, if you are somewhat humble and you're not sort of an egomaniac, you know, learning to sort of have convictions without being a jerk is actually requires practice. It's difficult. So trying to like, you know, I think I mentioned in an earlier uh, discussion, um, you know, being somewhat embarrassed initially that we used behavioral finance at, at Driehaus. And then I was talking to my friend who had you know, worked closely with Stan Drunkenbiller and, and he started to sort of like corroborate and, and agree with me and, and express that that was essentially the tools that they used as well. I was like, oh, but I needed, I needed somebody to reassure me of that. Yeah. Yeah, you needed to hear it from somebody else. I mean, I think all of those points, except for the tinkering one, are incredibly related, where it's just one, expose yourself to many different ideas and perspectives. You can do that through reading. Make sure you're reading a balanced diet, I think, as you said before, which I love. But yeah, it's the same point of, you know, I think networking, and I think you said it really well, it's not around networking, quote unquote, to, uh, you know, raise more dollars, do X, do Y, do Z, do Z. It's about networking to meet great humans. Because I think if you, you know, are around great humans, if you're constantly spending time with people that you're impressed by that think differently than you, I think you're only going to get better. <laughs> I think you're, you're only going to get sharper. No, that was an incredible answer. If you can, you know, I think the next question I was curious to dig into, and this is a really difficult one. So sorry for, you know, kind of lobbying this your way, but if you had to distill down your investing philosophy into just a few words, what would that be? And it doesn't have to be just a few words. You can kind of expand on that. But just what is your kind of overarching philosophy and, and approach? Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, I think we emphasize quite a bit, like we talk a lot about second derivative and inflection points. And I think uh, it kind of goes along with the idea that you know, markets are fluid and cognitive biases you know, have been proven for a reason. People have anchoring biases or recency biases where they are really hoping to cling to some recent data or a pattern and extrapolate that out in the future. And while that's certainly like meaningful, obviously, if it were that easy, everybody would be able to invest. So really paying attention and um, kind of being hyper-focused on those second derivative changes is, is, I think, really paramount for us. And in our case, we predominantly focus on earnings, you know, changes to earnings and the income statement. But you know, it's, it's really applicable to whatever area you would like. I think integrating you know, the macro as well as the behavioral dynamics, uh, overlaying those on top of a bottom-up driven philosophy is, is unique. It, it, it requires some more work and effort um, and skill set. But I think that gives us a differentiated process. As I've discussed sort of ad nauseum, um, yeah, I think having that macro understanding and capability, not to mention you know, having some ability to observe the market in an era where I think, you know, policies are, this pendulum is shifting pretty aggressively. You know, I think those three pillars integrated together correctly are really powerful. And lastly, it seems kind of silly to have to say, but just working hard. I think a lot of, not say everybody, but I think a lot of people, this idea of like, we have the perfect template and a process to me, it's, it's, that ends up being coming pretty static if that if you really believe um, and you know we've seen investors who yeah I, I think value investors are just as smart as growth investors but um, you know we've talked about this so back in 2010 you know when they'd had their first kind of bad 12 months in a decade I'm sure most of them said look at the last decade buy the dip we believe in what we do we still believe in intrinsic value and they just weren't willing to acknowledge like that the Fed had, you know, basically the referees had completely changed the rules of the game. And so, so yeah, I think having that, that flex, you know, that flexibility and, and working hard at that is, is, and it kind of ties in with the tinkering and the flexibility and everything else. But, you know, that's, re that's really important. But yeah, I, I mean, I love to use the sports analogy of like, if you were a coach and you have a team and you're just gonna say, Hey, these are my best five players and we're putting them yeah, out on the field, no matter what, I guess, let's say the best 10, because it's probably football or soccer, no matter what, irrespective of the conditions. And then you're another coach who says, well, of course, if the dimensions of the field are different, or if it's raining, or if it's cold, or if my opponent is fast, or opponent is slow, of course, you're going to change your strategy, or yeah, it'd be 
absurd not to. And yet when you think about how people invest who just are so dogmatic and they see that as a badge of honor, I think it's a massive mistake because you're just essentially saying, I'm going to put the same nine guys on the baseball field, irrespective of all these other variables. And it just makes, it makes no sense. It's, it's lazy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to use another sports analogy, I guess it would be like a quarterback that doesn't adapt to different games and just shows yeah. up at every game, plays the same way, and it's just like, this is just the way I do it. Totally. And yeah, It's what's hilarious is if if that were to be come across in an interview with a quarterback, everyone would immediately be like, this doesn't make any sense. And that quarterback would be gone. But in the world of investing, a lot of people show up as that quarterback game after game after game. After yeah, game. exactly. <laughs> I mean, somebody, yeah, the guys in the game, exactly, to your point. Yeah, if you go show up and the other team's stacking the box with 10 guys and just keep running the ball every single time, and it, it just the idea of like not adapting is just strange strange to me yeah yeah i agree but it it, it is something that um clearly is not uncommon uh which yeah. know, makes makes one wonder <laughs> yeah it does it does the next one i want to ask about is a book article or paper that you love that you think more people should read and i'm trying to make this as open as possible and and just kind of have you share something fascinating you've read recently something fascinating you read a while ago that you keep thinking about and that just really you're like more people need to read this <laughs> yeah so i've i've mentioned stan drunkenmiller a handful of times i i need to make sure i'm getting the title right but there's a, an interview with him that's years old now uh where he speaks i think at the it's called the lost tree club oh, yeah. or we, we can clarify we'll link to that i'll is. link to it in the show notes for everybody. yeah um and i just think that's sensational and again and part of the reason i admire him is because he thinks kind of like we do or maybe we try to think like he does where you know, macro matters. He acknowledges that liquidity is really what drives markets. And, you know, throughout the interview, you just get a sense of how malleable his mind is and how he's this great, revered investor. But to me, very different from someone like Buffett. He's like pretty open about how flexible he can be and the mistakes he's made and how he is willing to reverse from those. Again, he's this quarterback who's adapting on the fly all the time and probably audibling 10 different signals at the line of scrimmage. So I think that's a great one. And I think tying in with the kind of behavioral, it's not a great title for a book, but it's called Richer, Wiser, Happier, which I may have recommended to you. But that was really enjoyable. It just was published last year. My good friend, John uh, Cheshire had recommended to me, which I, because I never would have picked up the book given that title otherwise. And it just profiles like nine or 10 investors that have very um, differentiated mentalities or mindsets. And so I found it fascinating because it's not a, as much about you know, the investment approaches or philosophies as it is about the psychology and the mindset. And just even one, just to give you an idea, an anecdotal story. I remember there's one firm where, which I don't disagree with them and yet I'm guilty of, is that people it, Bloomberg can be addictive. And so... They needed a Bloomberg, they felt, as part of their firm, but they placed the Bloomberg terminal at a kid's desk, like a you know, five-year-old child's desk, so that it was extremely uncomfortable to sit kind of hunched over on the ground. And you know, they said you could last maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 tops. And that was just, it was a strange psychological way of doing this, but you know, they were able to constrict the amount of time that uh, they were on the Bloomberg. So I think those two are both great. Yeah. And you definitely turned me on to that Lost Tree Club interview. Uh, and it was a PDF I found. I think you might have sent it to me. So we, I, I'll find that again. I'll make sure we link to that in the show notes for this. You'll be able to find that at outlieracademy.com um, if you click on this interview and, and go to the show notes. But it's definitely one of the best things I've read in the last year. And, and yeah, just to re, you know, kind of say it again, I think what I really appreciated was He's obviously been enormously successful. He's very open and transparent about what went well, what went poorly. You know, he's just almost like an open book, which is which is wonderful. And he's just full of full of wisdom, and he and he's taken a really unique approach. And a lot of it is what's what's great about the interview too is it's not do this, do that. Here's what you know. Here's the rule. Here here's that rule. It's very much just here's how I think, and, and it's a an outline of you know how an incredible investor approaches it at the highest level, which is I think wonderful. I want to ask two more questions. The next one is, uh, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a left you know, uh, hand turn. And I want to ask if there's a tiny habit or practice that has had the biggest positive impact on your life. And this can be any dimension, just something that you started doing more regularly, you incorporated into a habit or a practice that has, has been great for one reason or another. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, yeah, it's a pretty obvious answer to me. 
but it's something that I'm still sort of building upon. I haven't perfected, but I, yeah, I think it, it, it links or it syncs up with you know, the premise of this creative tinkering and the ability to provide yourself with time to really structure your thoughts and escape the, this hyper uh, frequency of like data and headlines and, and news and um, the emotions that come with that. So yeah, it's, it's meditation, which you know, I and, and a number of my teammates uh, began doing over a decade ago. We, you know, it was recommended to me by someone after you know, it was becoming pretty clear at a young age that I wasn't managing my stress of trying to manage, you know, oversee a fund for the first time, particularly well. And coincidentally, the Transcendental Meditation Center of Chicago was literally the building next door. So I quickly ran out of excuses for not trying and, and was skeptical. But then, yeah, it's not a panacea, but have been really uh, kind of stat- yeah, flabbergasted at how, how helpful it can be, especially if practiced correctly, which again, I don't always find time to do. And similarly, uh, yeah, I did exercise, which, you know, advice I've gotten from some other people, but making sure that you do spend at least 30 to 60 minutes a day outdoors. I mean, outdoors and in open space, I think is even better for your mental state. But, you know, even if, even if it uh, just implies getting into the gym for 30 minutes, something where you can focus on you and your well-being. And although I do listen to podcasts often, if I'm biking or at the gym, that relate to work, um, you certainly have the option there. And you're not, at least you're not tethered to your screen and, and um, surveying the news of the day. So I, I think those, those two things are important. Yeah. It's amazing. Two totally different ways to basically disconnect, like unplug yeah. <laughs> this constant feed, even just in your own mind, that your own mind's just constantly um, run, is running wild with ideas or thoughts or, um, I don't know, concerns. Last question, what is the most important lesson you've learned so far in business and life? Another super wide open one. It's probably an amalgamation of some of the answers I've given. Um, I think, yeah, I think I mean, that open-mindedness I, I continue to emphasize is, is important because it requires work. I mean, even though I preach this, um, it doesn't mean that I practice all the time and Obviously, Dalio with his whole radical transparency concept, it's something that he hammers upon um, perhaps too much. But so I say embracing that, but also practicing that, which kind of to your point earlier of looking into the mirror can require, um, it can require a lot more thought and, and effort than maybe you anticipate. I think, you know, I'm sure myself not excluded, a number of people believe that they're open to criticism or critical feedback. And the reality is you I'm sure have witnessed too, is that people really are not. That's probably the biggest. I think the other, um, which should go without saying, but is, is just, just working hard. Um, yeah, I've encountered more and more people who really struggle with particularly new hires, but um, I don't know if it's generationally the sense of entitlement or this sort of need to, uh, contrast yourself with your peers. My peers have achieved X, therefore I should achieve X or X plus one. Um, or how many people come in for interviews and explain to me the job that they want five or 10 years from now, which I fully appreciate and already understand that. But it's amazing to me how much one can differentiate themselves simply by professing how much they want to do this job here and now. Or another way to put it is, you know, would you take the yeah, someone who can survive and is really resilient and adaptable. So the theoretical person that earns their living sort of as the shell game, you know, person in, in New York City or on the streets, so to speak, and, and, and makes it each day through their own in, in intuition, innovation. And then finally, I just think I think casting the wide net, which we've already talked about quite a bit, but I think that's um, which, which ties in with being flexible, but really is ingrained in the practice of how do I challenge myself? How do I challenge my thoughts? And, you know, something where if I were ever to have a theoretical firm of my own, um, what I really want to do is surround myself with individuals who I felt were smarter or more accomplished than myself, because, you know, what's better than being able to bounce ideas off people where you can, where you feel like they can lift you sort of up or increase the value of your ideas as opposed to, I feel like a lot of people that want to be surrounded by you know, quote unquote, yes, people. And in that case, 
you know, you're, if anything, you're just bringing yourself down. You're certainly not getting any value add from those around you. So I think you can do that in your professional setting. You can also just do it through your, through your network or through even, yeah, podcasts and, and literature that you're reading, like we've talked about. Yeah. So well said. I mean, I love that you brought up that, you know, being open-minded is, is active, which it is. It's incredibly active. You, you, it's not a passive thing where you just, you know, just sit and say that you're open-minded. It is very much challenging your own assumptions. And, you know, something that I try to do, I'll just share one random little thing, which I, I try not to do, but something that I've tried to do over the years uh, that's in line with this is, um, so I'll give a, a tangible example. There's a book I read probably for the first time, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. And I'm going to totally butcher the title, but it's basically around how to double the profits of a business in 90 days. And, you know, clearly you can tell by reading that headline, it's very polarizing. When you read the book, there's both good ideas that completely make sense. And there's stuff that seems really aggressive (laughs) and stuff that, you know, I would not personally do. But the reason I wanted to read it was it was incredible. The book I could tell was incredibly polarizing, whether to look at the, whether I looked at the reviews or talked with people about it. And just a, a technique I've developed is like leaning into that. So when there is something that's polarizing, as opposed to being turned off by that, being open to it and, you know, reading it at least open-minded and then just trying to take out what is, what's valuable from it without having this belief that I need to take everything. I don't have to take everything. I just have to take the ideas that make sense to me. Thank you so much for the time, Howie. I, I loved all the points you emphasized and, and how many of your answers reflected other <laughs> other answers, because it really is a couple of, I think, underlying really big ideas Thank you so much for joining me on 20 Minute Playbook. This has been so much fun. Yeah, Daniel, that was great. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode at outlieracademy.com slash 107. That's 107. For more from Howie Schwab, listen to episode 104, where he joins me on our Investor Spotlight series to go deep on what it's like to invest in emerging markets around the world, including the good, the bad, and the ugly aspects. The biggest lessons that Howie's learned over the last 20 years, including some incredible stories from investing in China and Russia. We talked through Driehaus's unique culture and why they're so strong at the behavioral and macro aspects of investing. And we spend a lot of time talking through Howie's research that he's pulled together over the last five years into why we're in the middle of a massive pendulum shift away from capital and toward labor, how demographics and politics are a part of that story, and what it all means in terms of investment opportunities over the next 10 plus years. You can now also find all of our interviews on YouTube at youtube.com slash outlier academy. On our channel, you'll find all of our full length interviews as well as our favorite short clips from every episode, including this one. So make sure to subscribe and get notified whenever we share new videos each week. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you right here next week on Outlier Academy.